In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight we are beginning our homily series on the prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian. It begins, O Lord and Master of my life. We have a God, we have a Master, and we have a life, and we are meant to do good with that life. And St. Ephraim the Syrian tells us this in his seminal prayer that sums up the very spirit of Lent and is thus prayed at home and during every weekday service. It begins, O Lord and Master of my life, and it goes on to ask God to remove from us certain vices and to grant us certain virtues. That first line, though, O Lord and Master of my life, really sets up the right orientation for all of our prayer. It is how we should begin every single day. Much like beginning a prayer with, in the name of the Father, or how the Lord's Prayer begins, our Father who art in heaven, St. Ephraim directs us to he who is the center and the focal point of our life, right from the beginning. And I suspect that he does this not only to remind us who it is that we are doing all of this for, but also because calling Jesus our Lord and the master of our lives is a truly humbling statement. And with this comes the humbling act of prostrating, literally lowering ourselves before Jesus three times during this prayer, demonstrating his lordship. But of course, we already knew all of this. If I had passed around a survey asking you, who is the Lord and Master, we all, I hope, would have answered Jesus. But the reason that we recite this prayer of St. Ephraim so many times as Lent is not simply to reaffirm the right answer. It is to make the statement true. O Lord and Master of my life is right in that it dogmatically, accurately describes Jesus in the ideal sense, what he ought to be. But for the statement to become true when we utter it, for it not to be a lie, it must practically and obviously be present in our lives. We incarnate the truth of this statement by prostrating, almsgiving, vigilance, and coming to church, among many other things. Calling Jesus Master means we trust him to direct us and that we follow his lead. It isn't enough for us to do what we want and then to pray that it hopefully aligns with God's will. We must first seek God and ask, what should I do? Where should I go? Too often, we see ourselves as the masters of our own destiny, making the final call on what school to attend, what job to take, where to move, what to eat, when to retire, and so on. We see ourselves as being so intelligent, so rational, and so uninfluenced. But for me, as I pretend to be the demagogue of my own destiny, I ask myself, what has it really profited me? I have certain material comforts, but if I actually gave up trying to control my own life, what would I really lose? And it is not even really possible for someone to be the master of their own life. I am not the master of my own life, but rather I'm a slave to fear. I'm afraid that unless I take total control, I will be unable to pay my rent or to have food to eat or have peers that respect me. My life is so fatted with comfort and convenience that I fear loosening my grip, if even slightly, will cause it all to collapse. And in thinking that I even have that much power, I'm also a slave to my pride. I'm afraid that I might even become like the downtrodden people that I'm supposed to have compassion for. But supposing though, that I did find myself among the needy because I gave away too much, because I trusted too much in God, if I gave up all of these material things, these so-called landmarks of maturity, of adulthood, and of progress, if I gave up even just a tenth of it, instead of loss, I would actually have so much more to gain. I would have things to gain that are unseen by most people. But do you really believe that's true? 
that the greatest pain in letting go of control is simply our pride, and that the greatest gain for us would be a comfort and a love that we have never experienced. St. Nikolai of Orid, writing in the prologue, urges us to be more confiding in the Lord than in your own mother. Confess all to him. He will not betray you. Embrace all of his commandments as beneficial. They will not deceive you. Inasmuch as you trust in God, so also be vigilant towards your enemies, the flesh, the world, and the demons. This week, my brother-in-law was ordained as a deacon, just as our own Deacon Luke was a short time ago. Now here are two men who stood perfectly still for the better part of an hour with a towel on their head, looking right at the icon of Jesus Christ. And not only this, but then the bishop washes his hands, dries them, and puts the towel back on their head. And if this had happened to me when I was younger, if somebody had put their used towel on my head, we definitely would have had a problem. But here are two men who were ordained to fulfill the need of the church, an emergency need that requires more men and women to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Master of their lives. And it's not just for our own sake, but it is for the sake of everybody else, especially all of those that live separated from the life of God. These two men and their families have dedicated themselves to give everything they have to glorify his name. St. Paul writes in his epistle that he is all things to all people for the glory of God. When they needed a tent maker, there he was. When they needed someone to distribute food to the poor, there he was. But as for me, I am probably just one or maybe even two things to all of you and to my wife, and it is certainly not enough. Blessed Theophlact, also of Orid, says that when the Lord renders to each his due reward, he does not consider the amount given, but the amount left. We must give not only our faith, but also an upright life. We must give everything to God, and we must have our morality be an offering to him. And so in Lent, there are 112 waking hours in this week, assuming that you sleep eight hours a day. And if we are going to tithe our time, that would leave us with 11 hours in the week to give to God. And we are here tonight, so that's one hour. The Divine Liturgy tomorrow is about two hours, so now you're up to three. But what about the remaining eight hours in the week? Who is the master of those eight hours? Americans spend an average of 38 and a half hours every week on their phone. It's as much as a full-time job. But who is our master? One-third of all internet downloads are related to pornography. Who is our master? We spend over 17 and a half hours each week watching television. And again, I ask, who is our master? Brothers and sisters, there is only one Lord, only one master, and we have only one mortal life. So let us set ourselves up for holiness by putting God first in all things, by beginning the day in prayer, going through the day asking God to reveal his will to us, and ending the day in thanksgiving. Let us be truthful in all things so that no one can cast doubt on us when we say, Jesus Christ, Son of God, be the Lord and Master of our lives. Amen.